this time, I would like to invite the second speaker for this, for this session, uh, Dr. Richard A. Tapia. He is a university professor, Maxfield Oshman Chair in Engineering, Professor of Computational and Applied Mathematics, Director of the Tapia Center for Excellence and Equity at Rice University. Uh, Dr. Tapia is internationally known for his for his research in the computational and mathematical sciences and is a national leader in education and outreach. Dr. Tapia is the sixth individual afforded the title of university professor in the 100 year history of Rice University. He is also the first in his family to attend college and he went on to get his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in mathematics from the University of California, Los Angeles. He was appointed by President Clinton to the National Science Board, and he chaired the National Research Council Board on higher education and that workforce. His many honors include the National Science Foundation's inaugural Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and engineering mentoring, the National Science Board's Vannevar Bush Award, and the National Medal of Science. Dr. Tapia, it's an honor to have you here today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, one of the things that we all ask is, you know, we talk about leadership, and I want to know, what is leadership, okay? so. At the bottom of this page, it says the following material that I'm going to talk about is taken from my forthcoming book, Losing the Precious Few, How America Fails to Educate Its Minorities in Science and Engineering. This is a book that will be out in about two or three months. And it, it's me. I mean, I, I state many of the things that I've experienced in my more than 50 years of academic life. So um, I, I want to put out a plug on that and everybody should buy the book, okay? Because not because we need to sell it, but because it sells many good things in there. Okay, so in, in the book, I started to ask, you know, what is leadership? And um, so let's go to the next page. Okay, so here, so what is underrepresented minority STEM leadership, okay? You know, and I thought, so I was, I was looking through definitions. I found an interesting definition and it said, leadership is doing your job well, okay? Then anyone can follow, okay? And I said, well, that's interesting, but you know, that's not specific. And it looks like something that would come on the, out of the Mr. Rogers show. So uh, I said, no, that's not gonna work. So I thought a lot. What do I consider underrepresented minority STEM leadership, okay? And I have five categories of things that a minority person can do. And it doesn't have to be a minority person, but basically that's what I'm talking about. So we're going to, um, the first one I say is earning high visibility for outstanding research in the same STEM discipline. Research still plays uh, the governing rule. And so one, high visibility and being very successful in research. Two, promoting the visibility of STEM in the public media. I mean, that's extremely important for people to understand how important STEM is in our lives. Three, being a member of high level national committees that impact STEM policies. And a lot of individuals uh, are very influential at the national level on various committees and participating in conferences targeted at underrepresented minorities identifying and taking a stand against wrongs and injustices, okay? Improving underrepresented minority student representation in STEM activities at a high level by working with students and educators, serving as a high level administrator, administrator who has a direct responsibility for STEM activity in academia, industry, business, or medicine. So if you, take part and do and excel in any one of the ca categories, I would call that a, a STEM leadership. Now it's quite rare to excel in both categories four and five. Look at five, 
That means you're producing a lot of students and working with them, and, or you're also a high level administrator, okay? We do have leaders who excel, excel in all but maybe category four. That means they do everything during the research and become you know, um, high level administrators or all but category five. Now, this latter uh, uh, approach has been my path. I have, throughout my life, I have chosen no administrative responsibilities. It's been a choice. And, and I've, I've turned down opportunities to become an administrator. I was a very successful chair. I turned down being an administrator at, um, as a dean or a provost or a president. Uh, that's not the things that I wanted to do. But I wanted to really excel in the other uh, four. And I think I've done uh, a good job of that. Okay? So let's go to the next slide, OK? Next slide. Now, let me say that my path, it was the, the timing was good because my PhD was in the, in the late 60s. And I became very actively involved in uh, an organization called SIAM, Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And that was my professional. And that, I would become conference chairs. I would give a lot. I would give talks. I would direct things, I would be on the board. And, um, and the other thing that I did, and it was good timing, was I was uh, a founding father of SACNAS, okay, Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. And this was 1972. And so as a young professor, I was actively involved in a math organization, very active, and in a minority directed organization. And together they gave me understanding and a lot of, um, let's say, leadership visibility, okay? And I'm telling you about my past. Now, let's talk about, I think we've gone backwards in terms of leadership, maybe because we were so aware of the things that were bad in the 60s and had to be taken care of. So you see this huge problem. And instead of being intimidated, you say, I want, to help. So what are the obstacles that work against promoting of underrepresented minority leadership today? Okay. Now I'm, you know, if anybody knows me, you know that I'm direct, I'm straight out. I say what I feel, but I don't try to upset people intentionally, but I always do, but not intentionally. Okay. One obstacle, including black and Latino immigrants in the pool of underrepresented minorities for improved representation of faculty. That means that you look at somebody from the barrios of Los Angeles or um, the barrios of Houston, and then you have to contrast that individual in terms of hiring with an, maybe uh, uh, an aristocrat from Colombia or Argentina. And that's what universities do because underrepresented minorities, the university uses that term and the individual self-identify, it isn't, you know, so you don't find universities saying, oh yeah, we're looking to solve the problem of representation in the United States. So those are the individuals that we, we should look at. To most universities and most of people, Latino is Latino. It doesn't matter if you come from Argentina or from Los Angeles, okay? And that distinction not being made greatly, greatly cur curtails the representation of STEM faculty in our, um, especially in our tier one universities, okay? Obstacle two, too few domestic underrepresented minorities are getting PhDs at our top research universities, okay? Um, and I'm talking about AAU tier one schools. We can't be in the minor leagues all our life, okay? We have to get to the point where we're in a position to do national leadership. And so if I look at the data from like, let's say my PhD is from UCLA. And yet, if I look at the data from UCLA today, there are no underrepresented minorities as graduate students in the uh, mathematics department, and there's no underrepresented minority faculty on the, uh, in the mathematics department. Yet, Rodrigo Banuelos and Richard Tapia both came from that environment. Okay, there's a thing called the mismatch theory, and the mismatch theory, uh, I won't go into detail, is essentially believing that underrepresented minorities are not good enough to go to 
AAU tier one schools. So we should send them to minority serving institutions exclusively. And that uh, assumes from the start uh, that they're not, you know, they don't have the proper talent. Okay? And several Supreme Court judges uh, have supported that. In fact, uh, Scalia and uh, Clarence Thomas have come out in the, when it was uh, Fisher versus uh, University of Texas, they made strong, uh, um, it, they made strong uh, recommendations about the, the mismatch theory. And that is to start minorities behind and keep them behind. So start them behind and keep them behind. Now, we find, I find in my experiences, and I, I've produced a lot of PhD students and I've worked with a lot. In fact, um, during the, the period, we had an AGAP grant and during the period of 2004 to 2011, which would be a seven year period, I either co-directed, directed or mentored 90 PhD students, minority, underrepresented minority PhD students at Rice in STEM areas, okay? And they were domestic black, they were domestic brown, and they were domestic um, Native Americans, okay? So we have to be there. So what we find is that a lot of um, minority students replace challenge with comfort. I find that a lot of the minority students that I, I talk to, they're very comfortable as Orlando Taylor was saying, in these HBCUs, okay? But comfort is not gonna take us to the top of the mountain, okay? It has to be challenged, okay? So um, let's talk about the Texas top 10% rule. Um, I have found in my studies, and it's in my book, that the top 10%, in te the top, Texas top 10% rule is that the top 10% of the students in public education are automatically accepted to uh, University of Texas, Austin, or Texas A&M College Station, okay? And those two schools are AAU tier one schools, and they're as fine institutions as you're gonna find, but they don't go. A&M has a, a, a black population of 3%, and UT Austin has a black population of 4%. They don't go. So, the state of Texas has 12%. So of the top 12% African-Americans in the state of Texas, 3% go to A&M and 4%. So you have to ask the question, where do they go? They go to the HBCUs. They go to um, Prairie View A&M and Texas Southern University. Okay? And they're happy and it's comfortable. And as Orlando so nicely said, there's a lot of culture, there's a lot of background, they feel that they belong. But they're missing the challenge of being educated at two of the top schools in the country. And that's where leadership comes from. That's where leadership comes from. So if, if I was picked to be on national science boards and essentially as I was and other committees, it came, a big part of it came because of my credibility and credentials are coming from one of the top uh, respected schools in, in the country. Now here's a hard fact. There are no Carnegie tier one or R1 HBCUs in the country, and there's no HBCU faculty in the national academies. So these students who choose to go to Texas Southern or Prairie View and not A&M and UT are doing it because it's a comfortable decision for them. And it's one that you know they're, they're, pleasant, they're happy with. They will say, my choice is the best because it makes them happy, okay? But our leadership, our leadership has to, if we're not represented at top universities, we will not be in national leader positions that are critical at things, okay? So let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, the fixes. We must lead ourselves at the national level. How, when are we going to say no more begging for help? So you look to these white leaders or you look to these people and you say, please help us. Please help us improve our representation, okay? We need it. And we've been fighting it for 50 years. 
we don't have to beg and plead. We should be in those positions, making those decisions and following it. When I get into a position, into a board, uh, uh, or if I give a talk, for example, at a university, here's a standard trick I do. And this happened recently at Caltech at, at MIT. Richard, we're inviting you to give a talk. Who's gonna introduce me? Uh, well, we have this per per person who's in charge of diversity off in left field. I says, no, I will give a talk if the president of the university um, introduces me. And they'll say, well, we didn't expect that. And I say, fine, then I don't need to give a talk, okay? And each time I've convinced them not only to um, have the president introduce me as I did as MIT and Caltech, but also if I give a talk on outreach or diversity or representation, I say, I also wanna give a talk on mathematics so I can establish my credibility that I'm not here just talking as a professional minority, but I'm here as a mathematician who happens to be a minority. And so we must be in those positions of leadership. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to be in these things. We just need a distribution. And I don't wanna see where UCLA has no underrepresented minority faculty in the math department, no underrepresented minority graduate students. So that means that the present doesn't look good, but the future even looks worse, okay? So we must prepare our domestic underrepresented minorities to academically be every bit as strong and competitive as our best whites and Asians. We are creative individuals. And so I teach many students, I've taught many classes. And so, so I see talent. I see talent among our underrepresented. I see creativity. I see excellent creativity, okay? But I, I, I see differences in preparation, which that's K-12 issue. And I see differences in terms of buying in, buying into that this is something that will be good for the country and good for me. So we have to essentially work with these students, motivate them and prepare them. And if we don't have representation, and I'm not talking about <clears throat> all, but I'm saying if we have no representation at UCLA and Stanford and Princeton and Harvard and Yale, then we're not going to succeed. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much.